In today's video, I have 10 really stunningly beautiful watercolour techniques, and they're so easy that anyone can do them. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Michelle, and on this channel, we do all things watercolour, as well as drawing and mixed media tutorials, even a little bit of business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube. And what could be better than free stuff? It's also free to subscribe. So let's get on with today's subject. So have you ever looked at a watercolour painting and looked at, you know, a specific part of it and thought to yourself, oh, that's such a pretty effect. You know, it's so lovely. It's so wow. It's so interesting. I wish I could do that. Today, I'm going to teach you 10 of my favourite techniques. They're really, really simple, really easy, and they're going to give your work that wow factor. Now, when do you use them? Of course, they're all fantastically perfect for backgrounds, but they do actually have quite practical uses too. So as we go through, I'll tell you the things that I would use these particular techniques for. But as I say, you can just use them as decorative parts of your painting or backgrounds too. Now, we're going to go through them quite quickly, but for all of them, there's a much broader range of things to be explored. Luckily for you, I've made videos on almost all of these techniques, full length videos. So what I'm going to do is leave links in the video description. So if you like one particular technique today, you'll be able to explore much more about it on my channel. If you can't see those links because you're watching on a big screen TV or something like that, then just put my name into the YouTube search bar and the technique and you should find something come up. And of course, if there's anything that you're interested in today and you want to learn more about, do let me know because the content on this channel is guided by you. So let's get on with technique number one. So the first technique is what I'm calling cauliflowers, but sometimes people, particularly in America, call them blooms. Sometimes we call them backruns. They're really simple to create. Now you can accidentally make these and you know, some people would consider them as a mistake, but a mistake is only a mistake when it's a mistake really. So I'm gonna show you how to do them on purpose today because they're really very pretty. And the good thing is that once you know how to do them on purpose, you'll also know how to avoid doing them when you don't want them. So the great thing about this technique is it only really requires a paintbrush and a piece of paper. There's nothing else needed. I do also have a piece of uh, paper towel here and that's going to allow me to control how much water is on my brush because this technique is all about water levels. So what we're going to do first of all is going to place some paint on the paper. Now you can do this technique light on dark, dark on light. It can even be done with pure water. In other words, the uh, Little blooms, the little cauliflowers can be made with water. If you're working with a darker colour, obviously that wouldn't show very much if you were using a really pale colour. But if you were using something like a bright red, you could use pure water to make the back runs or the cauliflowers or the blooms or whatever you call them where you are. Now, to understand why this works, we have to understand some basic physics. Now, I'm sure if you've been watercolour painting, you've had the trauma of painting next to an area that you thought was dry and you wanted a nice sharp line and then all of your new paint bled into the old paint. This is because the water, from a physics point of view, is trying to seek a level. There's more water in one area, so it wants to spread to the areas where there is less water. Now, if there's no water at all, in other words, if the wet paint is on a dry surface, then surface tension comes into play and it'll pretty much stay put. But if you've got wet paint on an area of paint that is less wet, so wet on damp, then that paint is going to want to spread out. And this is where we get these nice effects. So you'll see that I've been chatting on here and I've allowed this to get semi dry. So I'm going to take a darker colour now. I'm going to take this purple and what I'm going to do is get wet paint. Now we could go on with sticky paint and it would pretty much stay put, but that's a different technique. So what I'm doing here is I'm dripping wet paint onto an area where the paint has become semi-dry and look what happens. It wants to spread outwards. Now you can do it in quite a controlled way like this, or you can add lots of different colors. We can allow them to get next to each other, put some more watery color on. Now for all of these effects, they're going to take time to develop as they dry. So what I'll do is I'll put a picture up the end of each one to show you how it dried. As I said, you can start off like this, keep it fairly neat. You can also further manipulate it by perhaps dripping in some more clean water or another color. And we get these beautiful, beautiful effects appearing. So what can you actually use this for? Well, you can imagine that you can use this little furry effect for things that look kind of furry. So you can use it for fur. And there are ways of controlling it. We've done these sort of in circles here. In other words, in drips. 
there are ways of controlling it so it just bleeds in one direction by controlling the water levels. So it can be used for fur, it can be used for things like brick walls and moss, anywhere that's a bit worn and got things growing on it. You can use it again for animal fur, for seashells, for anywhere really that you want this kind of spreading out furry effect. I've even used it to put grass in the landscape by controlling which side is wet and having the grass so it always grows upwards. And I have other videos where I show you how to do that technique. This is one of the most useful techniques that you can master. And of course, learning to do this and practicing doing this does help you to avoid it happening. If you see it just starting to happen in an area where you don't want it, the trick is to try and smooth out that area so that you even out the water levels. If the water levels between one color and another are the same, then the paint won't try and travel to the other side as it were. One of my favorite techniques, and I think it's really, really beautiful. So next we have one of the most common techniques that's used in watercolor painting, and that's to use salt. Now you will find different people on YouTube teaching you different ways of doing this. There's not really a correct or a wrong way of doing this technique because a lot of it depends on things like humidity and your local weather conditions. But I'm gonna show you the way that I do it, and I do have a full length video that goes into it in a little bit more depth. You'll find that in the description of this video. So I've got here some sea salt such as you would cook with. You can see it's quite large and chunky. Now people sometimes say to me, well, can you just use table salt? To be honest, anything you put in your watercolor and allow to dry, it's gonna leave some kind of impression. So certainly it can be used, but you might find the effects were so subtle you could barely notice them. So the bigger and chunkier the salt, the better the effect you're going to get. And again, we're going to start with very wet paint. Now, sometimes people say to me, oh, you shouldn't use salt, it's, uh, you know, it damages your paper. Well, it, maybe it does, you know, lots of things damage your paper after all. It's really something that you have to decide for yourself. And we're going to apply very wet paint here. And I'm going to put the salt on really while the paint is still very wet. Some people will tell you to let the pigment get partially dry first. That's never worked for me, but do experiment for yourself. And we're just gonna drop the salt in. Try not to be too regular with it. The human brain always wants to make patterns. Just let it fall where it likes. And if you've got some areas that have got more on and others that have got less on, that's really helpful. Now, this is a very hit and miss technique, by which I mean it's very hard to judge what results you're going to get. A lot of it depends on the humidity and heat conditions in the room. Also depends on the type of paint that you're using. With all of these techniques, the more granulating your colors, the more results you'll get. Really the worst that can happen is you'll get some interesting little marks appear where the salt is. But if you're lucky, you'll get some really interesting crystallization effects. One thing I find works really well is to go in with more color and place it next to the little salt crystals. And what this does is because the water levels are becoming more uneven, in other words, it's starting to dry and you're now introducing more wet paint, I do find that this just sort of gives it a bit of a kick and increases the chance that you'll get those little crystallization markings appearing. And just like the last technique, you can also go in with clean water in order to accent this further. So when might you use this technique? Of course, it's fantastic for backgrounds, but it also looks really good if you're trying to paint rocks that have got things growing on them. It's also absolutely amazing for snow scenes and for making areas that just look kind of icy and crystallized. Anything from realistic snow landscapes right through to Christmas cards. This is a really, really beautiful technique and it's popular for a reason. And before we go on to our next technique, I should show you just how to finish this off. So all you do is allow it to get dry, and I mean absolutely bone dry several hours or even the next day if possible, and then just hold it over a trash can, either brush off the salt or if it's stuck a little bit, you can use an eraser to remove the rest of the crystals and then you're just left with the pretty effect. Now, if you've ever tried to mask off part of your work with masking tape, you'll have found it doesn't work very well, does it? The uh, watercolor tends to seep underneath the edge of the tape. Masking tape doesn't really preserve the area very well, but every cloud has a silver lining. We're going to use that very fact, that failure area of masking tape in order to make a really, really cool texture effect. It's not often used in watercolor painting, but it's one of my absolute favorites. Let me show you how it's done.
For this next technique, you're going to need masking tape. I've got some thick masking tape here, some wide masking tape, but you can use any. It just gives you a little bit more options if you can make larger areas, but the thin stuff works just as well. What I've done with this is I've stuck it onto my clothing several times. So what you need to do is reduce the sticky because masking tape can tear your paper if you're not careful. So reduce the stickiness by about 50%. You can see I've got an area here that's been pre-painted and is now dry. This technique does actually work on white paper, but I just think it's so much fun to layer. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just tear the paper and you want to work with torn paper rather than cut edges. Of course, that's an option too, but I like to tear the paper. What it's going to do is it's going to encourage the paint to go underneath the edges and just be a little bit more ragged. Now you can just make random shapes like I am today. But I've also used it in backgrounds to make sort of an idea of flowers perhaps in the distance or leaf shapes. But today I'm just going to make some absolutely random shapes and we're going to stick it down. Now even though we reduce the sticky, you want to press it down quite a bit because the paint's so good at getting under it that it may go under the whole lot if you're not careful. You'll still get an interesting effect, to be honest, but it would be nice to see these colours underneath at least partially reserved. All you need to do now is paint on top of the area. Try not to take the paint too much on top of the masking tape. I don't know if you can see it's already going underneath there. If you go across the top, because it's somewhat porous, I do find that it then just goes completely underneath the whole area. You'll see that I'm using a darker colour here, simply so that any light areas will show up. And just taking the paint roughly up to the edges of the tape. Now, unlike some of the other techniques, this one doesn't have to be bone dry. It's not like the salt. You don't have to wait until it's bone dry before you remove the tape. However, you do need to let it dry enough that nothing's going to smudge or run. So once it gets about 80% dry, then you can lift off the tape. Now the easiest way to do that is to get a little craft knife, and just lift the corner and then you peel the tape off carefully. Keep the tape at a low angle. In other words, pull it back horizontally. Don't lift it upwards. The more upwards you lift it, the more likely it is to tear your paper. But as long as you've stuck it to your clothing beforehand and removed some of the sticky, and as long as you remove it slowly and carefully at a low angle, you shouldn't have any issues with it tearing your paper. I'll put a picture up of how it looks because it's a fantastic technique. So apart from backgrounds, which is the main way that I use it, what can you use this for practically? Now we spoke about backgrounds and we spoke about abstract backgrounds, but as I said, you can also make it look like things are in the distance. I did it very effectively for snowdrops once. In other words, I have some clearly painted snowdrops in the front. And then I did some snowdrops out of masking tape at the rear. So it almost looked like they were kind of raggedy edged and a bit more in the distance. But you can also use a technique like this to get something like plaster walls. You know, those very old old rough farmhouse walls where the plaster has been sort of put in lumps or to get areas of concrete, rusted metal, things like that. This is one of my favourite techniques. I've got a full tutorial for how to use it as a background technique. You'll find that in the description of this video. At this point in the video, as always, if you're really enjoying this content, if you're getting some value from it, please can I ask you to click that like button. It really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. If you click that thumbs up, if you share, subscribe, or leave me a comment. YouTube will push this video out to more people. So if you're enjoying this content, please take time to share it with someone else you think might enjoy it too. And don't forget to subscribe. Subscribing on YouTube is free and I'm almost at 100,000 subscribers at the time of making this video. So I'm super grateful to all of you who watch me here on YouTube. Next up is a really underrated technique and that's oil pastel resist. Now don't worry if you don't have any oil pastels, there are other things that you can use too. I'll explain as we go through this technique. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that oil and water don't mix. Here I've got some oil pastels. I've got this sort of fun metallic kind of goldish color. We can make some marks on the paper. Now you'll notice that it doesn't make sort of very clean marks. There's lots of gaps because the paper's bumpy and you can see the pastel isn't going into the bumps. But actually this is a great advantage because it's just going to make those marks so much more interesting. We can even shade a whole area like this. 
and all you need to do now is apply paint. Now, a couple of things to consider. First of all, this is permanent. You're not going to get this off of your paper. Worst case scenario, you can try an iron and a bit of paper towel on top. But you're never really going to remove all of it. So just remember that it's permanent. So a good idea to try this one out on a scrap before you commit to it on a painting. Another thing to note is that you should use an old brush because the oil pastel often kind of lifts up and ends up on the bristles of your brush a little bit and um, it often doesn't come out. So use an old brush for doing this technique. You can see the interesting results that you get. Now, what do you do if you don't have any oil pastels? Somebody in the comments always says to me, Michelle, can I use my kids' crowns or my grandkids' crowns? The answer is absolutely yes, you can, if they'll let you get hold of them. So crowns can be used. Another thing that can be used is candle wax. Now, candle wax is even more interesting because it's transparent. In other words, you can start with dry paint, just like we did on our last technique, and you can reserve that colour by putting the clear candle wax over the top so just any household white candle can be used. Oil pastels are my favourite. These are the Talons Van Gogh pastels. They're really very cheap. You can get a whole set on Amazon for not very much money at all and they really add some interesting textures, some interesting options to your work. Now can this be used for anything practical? Well absolutely yes it can. I mean look at it already. It looks like a piece of knitting doesn't it? You could do all sorts of techniques for things like painting rugs and areas of knitting. But look at this technique down the bottom here where I've gone across. Does it remind you of anything? What about sparkle on water? This technique is absolutely fantastic for getting the sparkle on water. And the good thing about oil pastels is they are opaque. In other words, if you've really messed up your water, you've been trying to get that sparkly effect and you think, oh, it hasn't really worked. I haven't reserved enough light areas. You can put a light oil pastel on top. Just remember to make sure that the paint is dry before you pop it on because it's not going to stick to the paper unless it's dry. It's also really great for getting texture on things like seashells, animal fur. I even used it once for coral. Sometimes certain techniques are just really popular, really fashionable. A few years ago, it was splattering. And a year or two ago, it was the bokeh technique. Now, again, I have a full length video about this one. We'll go through it quickly. It's a fantastic technique, especially if you need a bit of background interest. It can really give your work that wow factor. So again, we're starting with a pre-painted piece of paper, but you'll see that this has got quite a dark color on and the paint is dry. Now the word bokeh originally referred to the effect that you get in some photographs where you get circles of light appearing in the distance, soft lights. Often when photographers were taking something like pictures of fairy lights or street lamps and they would appear much larger as circles. It's a really beautiful technique and people started mimicking it in paint. Now there's definitely more than one way of doing this technique. I've got a full tutorial for you, but I'm going to show you the one that I use most often. So I've got a stencil here. Now, if you don't have a fancy stencil like this, it really doesn't matter. I assure you that if you go through your recycling bin, and look for a few lids and pots and things like that, or even your cookie cutters, you'll find something in your house that you can use. What we're going to do is I'm going to take, I've got a piece of cotton wool here. It's a cotton pad such as ladies use to remove their makeup. And I've made this damp, but it's not dripping wet. We don't want the water to go underneath the stencil. What you're going to do now is just hold it down and you're just going to make circles. What we're doing is we're lifting out the colour. Now, how much the colour comes out depends on what pigment you've used. Obviously, staining pigments are harder to remove. And I'm actually working on quite cheap paper here because this is just a YouTube tutorial. And so the paper starts to lift after a while. If you've got a cotton paper, you'll find you can give it a lot more aggressive treatment and probably lift out a lot more. But that's not too bad at all there. What you want to do is vary the sizes of these circles. So let's do a larger one here. And you see that I moved around so that there was a clean piece of cotton wool. So I'm just moving around to get cleaner pieces. And we'll do a few of these in different sizes. You can allow them to overlap in places too. That looks quite nice. The main thing is to avoid them being too even. Now you can just leave it like this. This looks really pretty, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow it to dry and then I'm going to paint some colors in some of the circles. Now to do that, you can use watercolor, but I'm actually going to use a little bit of white mixed in, a little bit of gouache or white watercolor. I'm not going to go right to the outside of the circle because I want to maintain that soft edge. So I'll give this a few minutes to dry and then we'll move on to the next stage.
So I do have some gouache paints, but I'm being rather lazy here. I'm just putting out the white. I'm just going to mix it with some watercolour. Now, this is titanium white. If you have a white watercolour, it may be zinc white. Just means it's a little bit more transparent, a little bit less opaque. And what I can do is just pick up a little bit of colour. Got a little bit of pink here. Don't go too dark with it because gouache actually tends to dry darker. Got a fairly small paintbrush. And then all I'm going to do is pop that in the middle. I'll do a few of these light pink. What about a yellow one? Remember, if these dry and they're not bright enough for you, you can always put another layer of paint on so they become more opaque. Just for fun, let's have a couple of light green ones. See, I'm keeping them very subtle here. You want them to be light so they glow. And what a really lovely result. Now, of course, this is mostly a background technique, but I've seen it used fabulously well to depict Christmas lights, things reflecting on glass crystal, anywhere where you want that real magical sparkly look. This is a really beautiful technique. This next technique isn't used very often, but it actually makes a good and realistic alternative to splattering. It's much neater as well. Let me show you how it's done. Now this next technique is really pretty. You can see that I've got some pencils here. There are two types of pencil you can use for this technique. I've got watercolor pencils. I've also got these which are ink tense pencils. So they look and act like watercolor pencils, but they're ink, which means they're a little bit stronger. And what we're going to do is we're going to make little sprinkles of them onto wet paint. Now, again, I'm gonna use fairly light colors so that they show up. But of course, if you're using lighter pencils you could use dark paint too now i'm going to use a knife to make my sprinkles but if you're not comfortable doing that you don't have a craft knife i've seen people use a tea strainer as almost a miniature grater or you can use a small scale grater as well such as you might use for nutmeg or something like that just experiment with whatever works for you i'm going to use a knife and i'm going to scrape like this i'm going to aim the pencil at the paper and scrape in a motion that goes away from me. This will keep me safe from getting cut. And what happens is that as the little bits hit the paper, because it's wet, they start to stick. The water also helps the pigment to release. So make sure that you're doing this onto wet paint. So get everything ready because you don't have long before your paint dries. And look at these beautiful little techniques that we're getting. So this is a great alternative to splattering. When you splatter, you tend to get these very sort of rounded splattery marks. And it's pretty obvious that you have flicked paint onto your paper. If you don't get it right, it can look a bit naff. That's a technical British term. You tend to get much more little long marks with this, tiny speckles, little straight bits. It just looks much more natural. It's very, very pretty. So what would I use this for in a practical sense? Well, of course, it can be used for any texture where you've got speckles, such as carpets, areas of pebble or stone beach or pathways. But one of the main uses I have for it actually is for botanicals. If you ever get those flowers where you have a little bit of pollen or flowers where you naturally have speckles on the leaves or the petals, this works amazingly well. If you're ever looking at a hydrangea plant again and thinking, how on earth do I get all those tiny little dots? This is your answer. It's so much more natural looking than splattering is. And the best thing about it is if you splatter and you get paint somewhere you don't want it, you've got to try and get that paint off. With this, it only sticks to wet areas of paint. So if you end up dropping some of your pencil in an area where you don't want it, just let everything dry and tip it off and no marks are left. Now, unlike other mediums like oils and acrylics, when you leave brush marks in watercolour painting, it doesn't always look that good, does it? They tend to run and leave harsh drying lines. You just don't get the same effect that you would get with those sort of stickier, more viscose mediums. But I've got a trick for you where you can use a product called Gum Arabic. It's going to slow down the drying time of your paint, make it more thick and sticky and shiny. You're going to be amazed at what you can do with watercolour and even be able to leave those sort of expressive brush marks without the usual problems you would get in this medium. So here I have some gum Arabic. This one is by Jackman's, but there are lots of different brands that you can get. 
And what is gum arabic? It is a natural product. The gum itself comes from an acacia tree. It's dried into crystals and then it's ground and mixed with water to make your gum arabic solution. This stuff is used in multiple products across the globe. It's edible or at least it doesn't harm you which means that it's used on the back of things like postage stamps and gummed tape. It's a natural glue. It's also used in your watercolour paints. Most of them will use gum arabic as part or all of their binder. There are many things that can be done with it. The main effect it has on your watercolours is to slow down the drying time and to leave them shiny. There are ways of using it for water reflections, which I've shown you in other videos. But in this video, we're going to use it to sort of mimic oil paints. So what I'm going to do here is just paint sort of a background and I'm going to be using some paint and also some gum arabic. Now you notice that I put the gum arabic out into a little dish first. Now the one I'm using comes with a little applicator, but some of them, I think the Windsor & Newton has sort of a wide necked bottle. When I first started using this stuff years ago, I would dip my paintbrush straight into the bottle and I thought the paintbrush was clean. Of course, the paintbrush wasn't clean. And what happened is I polluted my whole bottle of gum arabic made it pretty unusable because it was all full of mucky paint so you always want to decant it before you use it and what we're doing here is we're getting a way of applying the paint where we can see the brush strokes do you see how i can just sort of paint with it like this and it almost looks doesn't it like oils or acrylics it's not going to bleed and run in quite the same manner as watercolours because we've made it kind of sticky and viscous. You'll notice I'm not really measuring how much I'm using and I am also using water, it's water soluble. Now you'll find that when this dries, it's got a very shiny look to it, which is why it's great for water reflections. But I also really like using it for a background because you don't have to worry about those back runs and drying lines if you want a blended area. It has quite a different look to watercolours and gum arabic is a substance that's really, really worth experimenting with and adds another more interesting dimension to your watercolours and how they look on the paper. Now, many of you don't know this, but right at the beginning of my art journey, I didn't actually start with watercolour painting. I started with drawing and I also started with printmaking because I was lucky enough that the town that I lived in at the time was home to Gainsborough's House Museum. Yes, that Gainsborough, his childhood home, and they had a print workshop. And so I joined and I learned lots of printmaking techniques, particularly monoprinting and lino printing. And so I've always been fascinated with this idea of crossing over and getting some monoprinting techniques within watercolors. One of the techniques that I experimented was imprinting with masking fluid. If you haven't used masking fluid, I'll explain what it is and how you do these techniques. You can get some really fun effects. I have a much longer video that gives you many, many different examples of the things that you can imprint with. We're just going to use one today. So I've got some masking fluid here. This stuff is liquid rubber and it's used for reserving areas of white paper. It can be quite tricky to use. But we're gonna use it here for something that's less practical and a bit more fun. We're still going to reserve the paper, but we're going to reserve it with a texture, with an imprint. I've used this for all sorts of things, including stuff like leaves. What I'm going to do here is one of my favourite ones, though. I'm going to get a piece of this netting. Now, this is just some net that you might have a bag of oranges in, perhaps. I'm going to cut a piece. What I'm going to do is dip it in the masking fluid and imprint it on the paper. Now, a few things to note about this technique. The masking fluid dries quickly, so we need to do this process fast once we get this wet. And also, if we dip it in so much that all of these sort of areas are filled in with kind of bubbles of masking fluid, we'll just end up with a big splodge. Now, to be clear, this is not a super accurate thing to do. It's very hit and miss, but it is good fun. So what I'm gonna do is soak the netting in the masking fluid, just pick up some like this, and then I'm just going to lift it up See what I mean here? You have to make sure that all of those little bits have gone separate. And then we're going to place it down and with some paper towel very quickly, I'm going to press and lift. Now you can see where the impression's been left. I think I'd like a little bit more. You could use a fresh piece, but I'm going to use the same piece. You will get very mucky fingers like this. Just do take some care. I know a few people are allergic to it. I am not. So again, we're going to place it down and just press and lift. 
Do be careful because if you press on an area that's already dry, you can lift that previously dried fluid off. Now, before we paint on top of this, we need to let this dry. Luckily, that only takes a minute or two, possibly up to five or 10 minutes. You'll be able to see as it dries, it'll go slightly darker in color. They're not all blue like this. Some are cream colored, some are white, but nevertheless, you'll be able to see with the white ones, often they go slightly transparent as they dry. And I'll edit out the bit where I just dashed off to the kitchen to remove um, at least some of the, uh, the gunk from my hands. What we're gonna do now is just paint over the top and all of these areas with masking fluid should reserve white paper. Now you can actually do this on top of pre-painted areas as well. In other words, you could paint a light color and then put a darker color over the top. Although I will say that masking fluid can occasionally lift a little bit of pigment out of your paper. So nothing really bad will happen. But you may find that if you were putting, say, a light blue underneath, you may find that when you lifted the masking fluid off, some of that color came with it. We're just doing ours on white paper. All I have to do now is allow this to dry. When it's dry, what I'll do is I'll just take my fingers and little circles will just lift all of that rubber off. I'll be able to tap it off into a dustbin and we'll just be left with a white pattern. I'll put a picture up so you can see how that looks. This is another technique that's really great for almost semi abstract things. Imagine if you were doing something with fishing nets, how much fun this would be. Again, I've used it to make sort of botanical items and imprints of leaf skeletons in the back of botanical works. There are any number of ways that you can use this technique. I've got a whole video that shows you all of the different things you can do with this particular technique, and I'm sure that you can think of a few extra ones too. Now, in other videos, I've used embossing and scratching techniques to make dents in paper. If you do it with pencils, what happens is the pencil skips over the top and leaves a white gap. But if you do it with watercolor paper, you'll find the pigment sits in the dents and makes little dark lines, and they're so fine, much finer than you could ever paint with a paintbrush. Today, we're going to use a knife. I'm going to show you how this technique is done. It has many practical applications, as well as being very decorative. Now, there are several tools that you can use for this technique. I much prefer to use a knife. I just find it gives more of an impression. What I'm gonna do, and be careful because sometimes the angle you see on the camera is a bit deceptive. I'm actually holding this almost horizontal to the paper. So we're getting the edge of the knife and we're not um, cutting the paper. Again, you always want to try these out before you do them on your paper. And I can make a selection of marks. So what we're gonna get here is we're gonna get some lines that are really much, much finer than you could ever make with a paintbrush. And of course, it's much quicker as well. If you've ever got tiny lines to make and you think to yourself, oh, I've got to sit with, a, you know, one of these brushes that's got kind of, you know, two hairs on it, made from, you know, hedgehog's eyelashes or something. And you're just despairing of how long it's going to take. Why not use some knife scratches instead? So you probably couldn't see them very well until I put the paint on them here using some nice dark colors. Now be careful with the colors because you need to go dark enough that the pigment sits in the little dips, but not so dark that you cover them up. The good thing is this is a very forgiving technique because you can layer and layer until you get the effect that you want. And sometimes what happens is the little lines appear and then as the paint dries, sort of disappear again. All you need to do is put another layer on top and they'll start to come back. And the more layers you put on, the more you'll find that these lines become more visible. And imagine trying to get marks as delicate as this simply by using a brush. Now these are fun, but what are the practical applications? Well, one of the things that I use this for most often is tree bark. So if you've ever painted driftwood or a bark of a tree up close, if you've ever wanted a tiny fine line down the center of a leaf, or perhaps just some squiggles and waves, then this is the technique for you. It can also be done on wet paper. So this is still wet. So let's see what happens when I go in now, straight on wet paper. Do be careful with this, because although it's very effective, the paper is very delicate when it's wet. So make sure you're using quite a thick, resilient paper. I'm not, I just like living dangerously. And you can enhance these lines even further.
This next one is one of my absolute favorite techniques. Now in the UK, we call this stuff cling film. In some other countries, you may call it saran wrap or even just sandwich wrap. Yes, we're talking about plastic. However, if you're concerned about the environment, be aware that you can actually reuse it since it's art, not sandwich wrapping. We don't have to worry about poisoning ourselves. You can just rinse it off after use, hang it up to dry. You can use those little bits of cling film again. It gives the most amazing and interesting textures and effects that you could simply never do with a paintbrush. So here's a little piece of plastic wrap cling film as we call it in the UK. So what you want for this one again is very wet paint. It's similar to the salt technique. You're gonna stick your wet paints on the paper and then you're going to pop the cling film on top and allow it to dry. I really feel we need some yellow in here. Now again, as with any of these techniques, if you've got granulating colors, they're gonna show up more. Make sure that your colors are dark enough. I've sometimes had people come to me and say, well, I tried that technique, Michelle, and nothing happened. And when I look at their work, it's not that they did anything wrong. It's just that the paint wasn't strong enough to actually show the technique up. So be bold with your colors. Remember, they dry quite a bit lighter. And we've got these nice wet paints here. All you're gonna do now is scrunch this up and place it on. Don't move it around. So I'm gonna just put it down like this and press it in like so. Now you can almost see the little shapes appearing already. It's sometimes quite useful to weigh it down. If you find it's not staying on the paper, then do weigh it down, but don't use anything very heavy. Some coins are absolutely perfect. Now, what can you use this technique for? Does it have a practical application? I think that the results that it gives look very much like fossils and flaky rocks. So that's an option for you. It's also fantastic for plaster walls or anything that looks a bit old and flaky. But for me, I actually just love this as a technique in its own right. I think it looks really, really beautiful. And you'll be amazed at the interesting shapes that appear as it dries. So do let me know in the comments which one of these techniques you like the best. Do you have any of your own techniques that you'd like to share with us? Perhaps a favorite beautiful watercolor technique of your own? Of course, there are far more than I've taught you in this video. Let me know if you'd like more content like this. And before you leave this video, don't forget to have a look in the video description. Not only have I got all of those longer videos that I spoke about in this video linked for you, you can also find out about all the online courses I run. I've got free stuff down there for you. I've got paid stuff as well. You can even take a free watercolor painting course. And if you enjoyed this video, you can watch another watercolor painting video right now.